Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning and welcome to the Sabbath study. As we return to our study in Ezekiel 33, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for his guidance? Shall we look to him for the wisdom that we're going to need to understand and place on a line the events that we're going to need to be understanding? For as we are told, we need to understand this book. We need clear guidance so that we understand more of the work that is before us. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity of opening your word so that we may be guided and directed in all that you would have us to do. Help us now, Father. May your angels attend us. May your spirit help us and enlighten our minds. May your blessing be upon us. May we find this Sabbath to be a Sabbath of rest, of joy, and of blessing. Direct us now in all things. Help us, Father, so that your character may be reflected within us. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us in all things. For this, we thank you, Father. For this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I gave you each a challenge this last week. The challenge has been to consider carefully Ezekiel 33, verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he, the wicked, do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. What have you taken from this verse this week in your considerations? I mean, I was munching. We're obliged to. Go ahead. Sorry, Dwight. We're obliged to tell the world. Okay. Christ soon, soon coming. Does that mean that we are to follow the admonition of the General Conference, whereby <clears throat> since 1905 they had not wanted Nashville to be warned that this warning should be hidden and placed where others would not know of it? Well, I don't go What's by your... anything, but Jesus. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Did John the Baptist go according to anything that the leadership of the church of his time had to say? No. no thank God. He called them. Okay. Now, we're going to look at a quotation. And this quotation is from the fourth spirit of prophecy. So those that wish to follow along should look at fourth spirit of prophecy beginning on page 205. We're going to read paragraph 206.1. Deeply impressed by these momentous truths, he felt it was his duty to give the warning to the world. Who are we talking about here? A message of the three angels. Agreed. <clears throat> but who specifically are we talking about in this particular passage? Would it be Miller? Definitely Miller. Now, were any of you encouraged by this week's morning study when we were going through the points of the dates from Uriah Smith's study on the book of Daniel when they were originally published. Personally, I think Smith's uh, writing is quite confusing. It didn't encourage me at all. <clears throat> well, it wasn't just that I'm looking at his direct writing. I'm looking at the days and the dates that came up. Now, Part of what we were addressing was that from the time that Smith began publishing his thoughts on Daniel to the time that his last article was published on the thoughts on Daniel, we came up with a time span of 1,290 days. One of the documents, as we were looking at it, came up with a total number of letters of 1,533. It was interesting that one of the days in which one of the documents was published came out to being the 25th day of the second month on the biblical calendar, <clears throat> on the rabbinic calendar, and also on the Islamic calendar. So you have a 252 or a tithe, a tenth, of 2520. And not often do the biblical, rabbinic, and Islamic calendars all come to exactly the same date. Now, Smith, in presenting these articles, was much 
frustrated because of some delays that had come in being able to publish his total study. <clears throat> he felt that people had become distracted and bored because they had not been able to follow this step by step. Yet the date on which the last article on the book of Daniel was published in the Review and Herald was the 18th of July of 1871. How often have we found a 1290, a 1533, 2520, and 187 all coming together symbolically within any presentation, even those that are hard for us to understand? I was much encouraged by the way that this all of this was being revealed when we were addressing this on Thursday. Now, how this ties back in with this with Ezekiel 33, here we are looking at how Miller had been studying. Miller expected to encounter opposition from the ungodly, but was confident that all Christians would rejoice in the hope of meeting the Savior when they professed to love. Now, if Miller was expecting that all Christians were going to rejoice in the hope of meeting the Savior. Was he disappointed when many Christian churches closed their doors to the message that he was giving? I'm sure he was. But did he stop giving his message? No. He gave full speed ahead. Brothers and sisters, were many disappointed in the situation that occurred after July 18th of 2020? Yeah, probably more embarrassed, I think. Here we are today. A message has been given. A warning has been placed before the world. A further warning is soon to occur. Miller's only fear was that in their great joy at the prospect of glorious deliverance, so soon to be consummated, many would receive the doctrine without sufficiently examining the scriptures in demonstration of its truth. Have we not seen this within the movement since July 18th? How many are there that would take great joy before July 18th in proclaiming this message, but would choose not to study after all of this fell apart? It kind of reminds me of the, the mixed multitude Agreed. when they came out of, when they came out of Egypt. They're all excited, but most of them, a lot of them, Fell by the wayside. Or Agreed. Went back to Egypt or whatever. <clears throat> Miller therefore hesitated to present it, lest he should be in error and be the means of misleading others. He was thus led to review the evidences in support of the conclusions at which he had arrived and to consider carefully every difficulty which presented itself to his mind. He found that objections vanished before the light of God's word as missed before the rays of the sun. Five years spent thus left him fully convinced of the correctness of his position and now the duty of making known to others what he believed to be so clearly taught in the scriptures urged itself with new force upon him. When I was about my business, he said, it was continually ringing in my ears Go and tell the world of their danger. This text was constantly occurring to me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. And thou hast delivered thy soul. I felt if the wicked could be effectually warned, multitudes of them would repent. And that if they were not warned, their blood might be required at my hand. Just a comment here. To I... Sure. That's okay. Um, so when it came to the July 18th uh, prediction, um, it was not not easy to um, I took responsibility for the idea that, you know, I could be wrong. Right. And uh, 
I spent a lot of time, you know, going over things again and again. But I had done such a thorough work and brought so many objections uh, to what I was doing. Um, it was really clear that the date could not be set aside. But I did know that it could possibly fail, right? That was the one thing that I was kind of disappointed about is that we didn't bring those reasons to people before July 18th. I felt that that was a mistake because um, I don't think m as many people would have been disappointed if they had understood thoroughly um, that we were on a line of failed predictions. But it, it's sort of also in God's providence. I mean, people needed to be disappointed, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I made it really clear that July 18th shows up. But the, what Jeff had presented regarding Jonah and also regarding Abraham offering up Isaac, I thought was important. But then they were kind of, this was kind of set aside because it seemed to me he was pointing to the idea of, well, you know, it may not occur. But people seemed like so shocked that it didn't occur, um, which, which I didn't really find that shocking. I, I would have been more shocked if it had occurred. If that makes sense. Even though I knew the date was correct, I just wasn't sure that it was going to happen. So anyway, what Miller went through. We, we've had many since then that have stepped off the platform that wish to set aside anything having to do with the symbolic use of numbers. Now, did Miller in this, in this example, did Miller stop believing in the validity of the seven times? Did he stop believing in the validity that Palmoni, the wonderful numberer, was in charge and was leading the movement. Did Miller at any time decide that the exposition of the 2300 evening mornings was not worth discussing? Miller was disappointed like everyone else. But he continued on with the work that was set before him, did he not? Mm, yeah. He began to present his views in private as he had opportunity, praying that some minister might feel their force and devote him to their promulgation. But he could not banish the conviction that he had a personal duty to perform in giving the warning. The words were ever recurring in his mind. Go and tell it to the world. Their blood will I require at thine hand. For nine years he waited the burden still pressing upon his soul until in 1831 for the first time publicly he gave the reasons of his faith. Do we have nine years to wait? How many are going unwarned? How many potential lives are we not accounting for? As Elisha was called from following his oxen in the field, to receive the mantle of consecration to the prophetic office. So was William Miller called to leave his plow and open to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God. With trembling, he entered upon his work, leading his hearers down step by step through the prophetic periods to the second appearing of Christ. With every effort, he gained strength and courage as he saw the widespread interest excited by his words. Though he had little of the learning of the schools, he became wise because he connected himself with the source of wisdom. He possessed strong mental powers, united with true kindness of heart, Christian humility, calmness, and self-control. He was a man of sterling worth, who could not but command respect and esteem when wherever integrity of character and moral excellence were valued. He was attentive and affable to all, ready to listen to the opinions of others and to weigh their arguments. Without passion or excitement, he tested all theories and doctrines by the word of God. And his sound reasoning and intimate knowledge of the scriptures enabled him to refute error and expose falsehood. Does this sound like the kind of person, as described by Desmond Ford, that Billy Miller was a great man 
to open the scriptures, but he really didn't understand what he was doing. He really didn't understand his numbers. I look at this, I read this in multiple volumes and find that Miller was much more humble than Desmond Ford, Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, W.W. W. Prescott, or Uriah Smith. Miller relied upon the word of God. Through it, his character was formed. His character was tried, polished, and through, through this, he reflected Christ. Now, letter 26D of 1887. I feel deeply over the way the mission has been run in Indianapolis, which may be, have been Indianapolis. Were there no men of spiritual eyesight? Where was the president of your state conference? What was he doing? Was he like Eli, easy, careless, ease-loving, unwilling to restrain evil, unwilling to correct the existing wrong? Were not Brother Peebles and his wife placed in that mission to be respected, to stand as experienced workers at the head of the mission, to correct the evils that would surely occur when young men and women are associated together who have no real dignity of character, no deep religious experience? If correctly managed, Some elements might be used and educated, while some should have no part with any mission because their stamp of character is such that they will never exert safe influence. Sister Green is one of these who needs a thorough conversion before her influence will be right. Her whole religious life has been defective. Unless she is thoroughly converted, transformed by the grace of Christ, she will never meet him in peace. Where was Brother Covert? Ezekiel 33, 2-9, quoted, The Lord has a solemn charge for his servants. I was shown years ago that Brother Covert was altogether too easy. He was not quick to discern and correct the evils existing in his own family. And this easy disposition was characterized has characterized his labors in the church from first to last. He has not been a thorough workman. He has left things undone, which ought to have been done with firmness and fortitude. Wrongs should have been righted, sins rebuked, and the standard lifted. Thorough work will have to be done throughout the state of Indiana before the Lord can bestow his favor. I entreat of you to look upon the work of your mission that unwise, undiscerning men have allowed to become burdened with a cheap, irreligious element and which, I say in the fear of God, has been a demoralizing school. Look, brethren, and consider. Here again, this letter was written in 1887. A year later, the president of the Indiana Conference, would have been one of those in attendance in Minneapolis and would have been one that would not have understood the messages of Jones and Wagner. If we are not willing to start with what is rightfully before us, our own homes, how can we then expect to have influence within the church, within the movement, in any other regard. Now, from Manuscript 75A of 1900, which was a non-published manuscript, God has forbidden us to think or speak evil of our brethren. Is this statement worthy of recollection? Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judgeth the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save or to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Those who act toward their fellow men without mercy will one day feel themselves the need of mercy. Are we to be critical of other brothers and sisters? Are we to speak and slander or gossip 
about other brothers and sisters. Is this the work that is before us? Christians have an important work to do. They are commissioned by God to watch for souls as they that must give an account. They are to reprove, to rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. God said to the prophet Ezekiel, So thou, O man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak and warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he does not, if he do not turn from his iniquity, he shall die in it, but thou hast delivered thy soul. To speak the word of God with faithfulness is a work of the greatest importance. But this is an entirely different work from continually doing censuring, thinking evil, and drawing apart from one another. Judging and reproving are two different things. God has laid upon his servants the work of reproving in love those who err, but he has forbidden and denounced the thoughtless judging so common amongst his professed believers in the truth. Any thoughts on this statement? Have we not seen this occurring within our families, within the movement, and within the church? Yes, all three. It's sad when within what's supposed to be the body of Christ, there are those that choose to say that others don't know what they're doing or that want to say, you can't trust so-and-so. He is not a truthful person. Don't believe a single word he says, especially when that one being so described is quoting scripture and is quoting the spirit of prophecy. Actions speak louder than words, and those who draw apart from their brethren in the ministry show plainly that they do not wish to work with them, that they surmise evil of the men to whom the Lord has given a place in his work. Is this referring to ordained ministers alone? Mm, all of us. It's referring to all of us. Segwaying to, t- to letter 208 of 1906. There is a group of men in Battle Creek who today would be standing on the platform of eternal truth had it not been for the acceptance of misleading sentiments regarding our creator, such as appeared in Living Temple. The presentation given to me of the perils of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, of the subtle, specious workings of the tempter on his mind, is as clear as the daylight. Men who ought to know their duty have upheld him in that which they knew to be wrong. All who thus sustain him bring upon themselves the displeasure of God. Those who should have discerned his dangers and errors have refused light, and therefore they are deceived. I know whereof I speak. I could relate many things, but the time is not yet come. Here again, she requotes Ezekiel 37, 33, 7 to 9. Excuse me. She continues, the sixth chapter of John is full of instruction for us. Study it again. The multitude did not believe my master. Why should I be surprised that men refused to believe me? If the world's redeemer was insulted and even mocked, shall I complain? I am constantly trying to do what I can to lead men to put their whole trust in Jesus Christ, who gave his own life to save souls. For over 60 years, I have spoken the word of reproof that have been given me of God. And now I shall not refuse to bear the message that God has given me. What is it about the sixth chapter of John that is important? Any thoughts? Well, there it shows the two classes, those who would walk away with him when he spoke hard sayings and those who choose to remain with him. Okay. Here, the sixth chapter of John begins with the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus also 
walks on water. He declares himself to be the bread of life. And he continues teaching words of eternal life. Here is Christ. Mm-hmm. Was he? Go ahead. Six, six to John, 30, 32nd chapter. I mean, the 30, 32th verse. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Okay. That's 32. And it follows with 633. What? And how does that read, brother? 633 says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Christ is declaring himself to be the eternal bread, right? Amen. It says in 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. If today someone was able to feed the five, was able to feed 5,000, and as Christ did, feed the 5,000, with five barley loaves and two small fishes. What would the response of the world be at that time if this was to happen now? Would they not look with wonder? Would they not be surprised? Since the time described here in the 6th of John, how many of us have walked upon water? Yet all of us have the opportunity to accept and to learn from what Christ is trying to teach us here. Christ says of his people, ye are the light of the world. It is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been so clearly open to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. This places on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge that he has given us. It is his purpose that divine and human instrumentalities shall unite in the proclamation of the warning message. Nine Testimonies, 19, paragraph 3. Are we today to collect rays of light from our study of the word and hide these rays so that the rest of the world are not benefited by them? It's supposed to share it, Rachel, not hide it. Correct. Are we to hide our light under a bushel, under a basket? Are we to not give a warning message? Are we not to show to the world that if character is not reflective of Christ, then the character is not of Christ? We are to be the light of the world. We are to be piercing the spiritual darkness. So far as his opportunities extend, everyone who has received the light of truth is under the same responsibility as was the prophet of Israel to whom came the word. Here again, she repeats Ezekiel 33, 7 to 9. Ezekiel is representing us. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Are we just to sit here and say, Jesus is coming, hallelujah, and not warn the world? What value will our words be then? What value will words be when the prophecies are completely fulfilled? Go ahead. I had a thought uh, you're asking about, um, you know, hiding our light under a bushel or to show the world. I was, I, the thought that came to me was about Gideon and hiding the torches under clay pot and then and then breaking them and the flames came out and lit the way for the attack sort of thing. I'm not sure exactly the particulars of the story, but the part of that story is smashing the clay pots. <clears throat> and that's how the light, that's how God is going to use us. He's got to smash the earthen vessels that we are so that his light will be able to shine out. So we must be broken. The clay pots, us, need to be broken for that light to shine out. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. I mean, it's the light shines out of the cracks in in our 
hu human nature, our fallen natures, are kind of like the the fallen vessels of our humanity, and and, and God breaks that up so that His light can shine out. Yeah. Okay. In this, I I, I mean I mean that needs to happen to, to to us on an individual basis for it to go for it to happen. Yeah, we, we each need to be have that experience of being broken so that God can use us to carry his light. To be fit vessels, we need to be broken vessels. Would a piece of pottery like you're describing from this of of this with Gideon? Sorry, would that, I, I missed that would what? Would, would this piece of pottery, as you are describing from this example of Gideon, which does represent our human nature taken from the ground and molded, would that piece of pottery that hides the light, would that would that piece of pottery burn from the fire? No. Can it within? Well, no. Uh, it, can, it would harden it. Okay. Now, Bake it. In, in the situation that, that I was using to describe earlier, if such a fire is hidden under a basket, under something that is woven, what would happen to that basket? With well, a the basket would catch on fire, but yeah, a bushel. So you mean a bushel basket, I guess? Correct. It's right in the fire. Exactly. So if it was placed under a basket, the basket attempting to contain the light would then be destroyed. In the situation with Gideon, the pottery itself could be benefited from the light, but when it is then broken, truly broken, the light shines as it had not been allowed to shine. Okay, comment from the chat, Jeremiah 18, 3 to 11. Why? Well, I can read it to you if, if you want. It says, then I went down okay. to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice. Then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Okay, this comes in line with this portion that is highlighted. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it is too late. Who is she writing to here? To whom is she All giving of us? Us. All of us. We are to be consecrated channels through which the heavenly life is to flow to others. The Holy Spirit is to animate and pervade the whole church, purifying and cementing hearts. If we are focused on tearing down others, how can the Holy Spirit animate and in pervade or 
come within the whole church. Those who have been buried with Christ in baptism are to rise to newness of life, giving a living representation of the life of Christ. Upon us is laid a sacred charge. The commission has been given us. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. You are dedicated to the work of making known the gospel of salvation. Heaven's perfection is to be your power. Is she saying here that we are to rely upon other men for our power? Well, that would be a big mistake. In this next section, she comes to us, the prophet comes to us and states, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why ye will ye die, O house of Israel? I was shown that God had committed your children to your trust, brother King, to fit them for heaven. Their eternal interest should be greater to you than your house farm, or anything else upon earth. Shut away from them every influence you can, which would lead them to lightly regard the truth. By mildness, and yet with the firmness of purpose, and by living faith, roll back the powerful tide of darkness Satan is pressing upon them. The Lord pities and loves them, and his arms are extended to receive them when they shall leave sin and folly and turn unto him. He wants to prepare them as precious jewels to shine in the heavenly casket. He wants to welcome them to his sheltering arms, that he may protect them from Satan's power. Is that a promise to us today? Is this something by which we should take great joy? Your daughter is convinced that we have the truth, but she has a love of the world and pride of heart. Her worldly friends and relatives stand in her way. She fears that she will have to cut loose from them, and the way to heaven seems too straight for her to follow. But I saw that she must make any sacrifice for heaven. The eternal reward is rich and glorious enough to repay her a thousand times for any sacrifice she may make. Satan is seeking to harden her heart and lead her to carelessness. She must resist the devil. Jesus, the dear Savior, is waiting to adopt her into his family. If she will yield her heart's best affection to him, who above all others is worthy of her love, he will purify and refine her and fit her for immortality. But she must have decision and not suffer Satan to use her relatives and professed friends to lead her from God in the downward road of folly and worldly pleasure. Through these professed friends who manifest a regard for her, Satan will strew the way to hell with tempting flowers to lure her on, to harden her heart and stiffen her neck against the truth. If she does this, she will suddenly be destroyed. And without remedy, said the angel in a solemn voice, Turn ye, turn ye, why will ye die? Ezekiel 33.11 Break the fetters of pride and folly, which would confine you and keep you in bondage and turn to God. Now, we're coming next to another non-published article. Why will you die? Why would we choose to die? when the offer of life is so freely extended. There is much yet to be addressed. There is much yet to be considered in all the rest of this chapter. We are barely scratching the surface. My recommendation for you for this next week is to consider again these two verses 
Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11. Why will you die, O house of Israel, when the way before us is so plain? Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? I just looked up the strongs on that word bushel. Okay. I don't know if that's any interest at all, all the numbers and such. But anyway, there's the definition of a bushel measuring okay. device. If you'd like to look at that. So what we have here for the bushel. Draw anything. So we're looking at that from the Greek, three, four, two, six. Any thoughts on this? Well, if you go uh, multiply three by four by two by six, you get 144. Now, isn't that interesting? So a bushel is about a peck, and very few of us anymore make use of those units of measure. But this is a measure of what? Liquid or dry? According to this, this would be a measure of dry. Do we wish to be, do we wish to be so dry that what we have to say is set aside or so dry that we blow away with the wind? A fire held under something that is dry will consume that which is dry. Okay. So shall we now then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the warnings that you are providing. We ask, Father, for your guidance and for your direction. Help us that we may give the warning that you weren't given to this world, that we may be prepared so that the blood of those that are to be worn are not then found upon our head. Direct us today. Be with us in all things. Place us where we may most clearly reflect your glory. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.